Okay, I'm sorry to take over the class from uh, our esteemed uh, Elliot, but I'm sure he'll give me the the right uh, to to take it over at this present moment. Okay, everybody. Good morning, everybody. As we start the uh, the uh, the portion of the week, the portion of Bahar. It's a fascinating Pasha. I think every week I say it's a fascinating Pasha, but it is every week is a fascinating Pasha, and. Um, we're going to talk about something that's amazing. It's going to be, uh, I hope that you uh, keep your heads on, so to say, as we go into a fascinating concept in, in Torah, a, uh, a concept that is a technical concept, but explains a broader issue. This year is actually, this year is connected very much to this week's Pasha, in the beginning of this week's Pasha, Bahar which is the mitzvah of Shemitah, the sabbatical year. The Torah says, it's on page number, text number one, page number 56. As I say every week, if you don't have the book, this book, this book of the, the book that we are using today is a, a book that will be used for many, many more weeks. So if you don't have the book, you should get the book. So it's in the, the verse says in Leviticus, chapter 25, verse number one. And God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and you shall tell them when they come to the land of Israel and they, I am giving to you a land, uh, the, the land shall rest on the Shabbos to God. The law of Shemitah. You may sow your field for six years and for six years you may prune your, field, your vineyard and gather your produce. But on the seventh year, the land shall be a complete rest, Shemitah, a Sabbath to God. You shall not sow your field, nor shall you prune your vineyards. The continues, verse number six, the produce of the Sabbath land shall be yours to eat. Whatever. We have the mitzvah of Shemitah. I think we left the door open. I'll open it. Can you do a remote? Nobody's there, nobody's there. All right, they, they came in. So, um, so the, we have the law of Shemitah actually, in Eretz Yisrael, today is the uh, year of Shemitah. This year is, is the year of Shemitah, which the law of Shemitah is an obligation even today that Jews, that farmers in Israel have to uh, have a, year, a sabbatical year where the farmers have to walk away from their fields. The fields belong to everybody and anybody can go into the field and take the uh, produce of the field as long as and you only want to take into your house produce as long as there is enough produce in the field. The year of Shemitah. So Rashi, the beautiful Rashi on the first Bahar Sinai, the first verse we mentioned, by Daba Hashem, by Daba Hashem and Moshe, and God spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. So we find that uh, this expression that God spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai is written. Why is it written? Why is it written by Shemitah? God spoke to Moses on Har Sinai. Every mitzvah in the Torah. So the question now she asks the question. Text number two. On Mount Sinai, what special relevance does the subject of Shemitah have to do with Mount Sinai? We're not all the commandments say that Sinai. So why are we here? Does the Torah mention Mount Sinai? Rashi answers. This teaches us that thus like Shemitah, it's in general principles and the finer details were all stated at Sinai. So here we have in Hebrew, it's actually which means it's general, it's particular, and it's minute dictakel in Hebrew. It doesn't even translate it because it just says general and finer. Dictator is a finer of the finer. So, you know, the real detail of every mitzvah was said on Mount Sinai. Likewise, so to every mitzvah was said on Mount Sinai. Every mitzvah. Not only every mitzvah was said on Mount Sinai, general principles were stated together with the finer details. You may ask, why couldn't the lesson be by other mitzvahs? Why did God Pick 
specifically this mitzvah, the mitzvah of Shemitah, to, to, to bring about this concept. So why is Shemitah used exactly to prove this rule? Explanation is, unlike other mitzvahs, we do not find the laws of Shemitah reiterated in the plains of Moses and Deuteronomy. Thus, we are compelled to say that its general principle, finer details are explained. We're all standing at Sinai. Every other mitzvah, almost every other mitzvah, Meshach Rabbein reiterates in the book of Deuteronomy. But he doesn't reiterate the mitzvah of Shemitah. So how did the Jews know the mitzvah of Shemitah when they came to the land of Israel that Moses didn't reiterate it in the verb? So it must be that Moses said all the particular mitzvah of Shemitah, all its all general and its fine detail, all was said at Mount Sinai. This in turn tells us that every mitzvah was conveyed to Moshe at Mount Sinai, everything, it's general, the general prints and the finer details. And later in that, and the, the commandments delineated in Dhamma were merely repeated and reviewed in the plains of Moshe, but not the originally given there. Every mitzvah was given at Mount Sinai. Not only every mitzvah was given at Mount Sinai, but it's general, the general law of the mitzvah, and it's detail, it's detail of detail. Everything was given at John time. Nothing hidden. So we can ask a question on this. What does it matter, <laughs> right? What the difference does it make exactly when and where the detail was said? What difference? What's the difference that the details are told on Sinai? Let's say the details are told later. So what is so important to tell me that the details are told on Mount Sinai? And still, why Shemitah? So Shemitah is, uh, wasn't said in Iris Maiv. Okay, so therefore Shemitah should have been chosen. There still has to be some connection between Shemitah, a, much, a more deeper connection between Shemitah and this lesson. Really, most of us will ask the question, why is there so many details in every mitzvah? Why is there so many details in every mitzvah? Why does every mitzvah need so many laws? Not only are there many laws in every mitzvah, there's many men hug him in every mitzvah. So you go to laws and there's customs, et cetera, et cetera. Why is that needed? Sometimes you get lost in all these customs, you forget the law. Why is there needed so many laws and details in every single mitzvah? That's three general questions that the Rebbe asked on this first Rashi. The Rebbe answers this question by first introducing us to a very interesting concept in Jewish, Jewish philosophy. In, in really, if you went to yeshiva, you went to, you went to, you learned Talmud, and you would hear this debate. It's a general debate, and I hope that I explain it well enough. So if you have any questions, don't be shy, ask. In, in, in the yeshiva world, we have a, a debate. The debate is when there's a mitzvah, the mitzvah shemitah, there's a negative and there's a positive. In the mitzvah shemitah, there's a negative mitzvah, you shall not work the land. And there's a positive mitzvah, you shall let the land rest. So you have two mitzvahs, one mitzvah I say, a positive mitzvah, you have to let the land rest. And there's a negative mitzvah, you shall not work the land. Or you shall not hold on to the land. So you have a negative and you have a positive. So in, if, if you are a Talmudic scholar, you would ask the following question. And this is, I'm going to teach you two words. Gavra and Hefza. Gavra means the person. Hefza means the object. In general, take this mitzvah of Shemitah, is it a mitzvah on the person, on the, on the landowner, on the farmer, 
Is it a mitzvah on him not to work the land? Or is it that the land is not allowed to be worked? It's a mitzvah on the chetza, on the land itself. Now you may ask, what's the difference? And I'll give you the simple difference. The simple difference is, a, as everyone can say, is a guy. If a non-Jew is allowed to work the land. If the mitzvah is on the person, so then if I send a non-Jew to work the land, uh, I, I'm not working the land. If the mitzvah is, uh, the negative commandment is on the land, then it doesn't have the difference whether it's a Jew or not a uh, non-Jew. The land needs to have its rest. So that's the question. The question is, do we, or is it both? Do we, is the mitzvah on the person or is the mitzvah on the land? Gavra, this is the, ter the Gemara terminology. Gavra is in Hebrew, that's Aramaic. Gavra is the person. Chefza, chefetz, comes with the object. Chefetz is the object. Who is the responsibility? You have the same argument in a mezuzah. Who is the responsibility? Is the responsibility on the person or the responsibility on the home? So, for example, the difference would be who needs to put the, the mezuzah on the door? The owner of the house or the renter? Is it a gavra or it's a chefza? Is the obligation on the person when the Torah says you shall have mezuzah on your door? Is it the obligation that the, every home, every building, every place needs a mezuzah? And therefore, if I build a building and I have built an apartment building with hundreds of homes, now I have to put the mezuzah on every door. Mm -hmm. Or the mitzvah is on the person. And I'm not living in the building. I built the building, but I'm not living in the building. And therefore, ultimately, every renter in this building, or everyone who buys a prop in the building, has to put the mezuzah on the door. Is it on the gavra or on the chas? It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't, it wouldn't need a mezuzah. Because it's on the gavra, that's the question. If it's on the chetz, the house needs the uh, uh, the house belongs to me. So that, but if it's on the person, the person living there is not a Jew, and he doesn't have to have mezuzah. This is the way we look. This is the way we argue on this in general on mitzvahs. So this concept would also be the argument on shemitah, when the Torah tells us that you that the land needs rest. The question is, is it on the person to give the land rest? Or is it the land on the land? The land needs rest, whether it's, 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 it's whether the land, I'm going to work the land, or get somebody else to work the land. This is a, a general uh, uh, argument, generally. So the truth is, it can be both. And he brings over here, Two uh, statements of Maimonides. So we have in text number 3a, Maimonides says that is a positive commandment to rest from performing agricultural work or work with the trees on a sabbatical year. So that sounds like it's on obligation on the person, on the gavra, on the person not to work the land. And then the Ramam says the other, the other way also. He says, in a, different, in, a, in a different part of the law, he says, That's in text number 3b. The earth should rest on the seventh year from all labors performed because of it. So that sounds like it's the chapter. It's not the, the, the obligation on the Jew, per se. It's that the land needs to have its rest. As I said, what is the difference, text number four, on what practical difference this distinction would make? So again, the Rebbe says in text number four, if the mitzvah is that the Jews' land should be left alone, untouched, in the sabbatical year, then it makes no difference who is blamed for violating this restraining order. Regardless of who does the work on Jewish own land, even if a Gentile, work, if, not, if not the Jewish land, it's something else. If the land belongs to a Gentile, so then it's not a problem. But as long as the land belongs to a Jew, this land needs to have rest. The landowner is liable for violating a positive image, even though a non-Jew 
went to work the land. Because the non-Jew is not, the non-Jew, there's no gavra, there's no obligation on a non-Jew, his physical entity, not to work. If the mitzvah is addressed to the person, then the Gentile works the field, the landowner is considered to be violating the mitzvah. This is a great debate in, 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 in Allah and Gemara. Gavra, how do you look? And the truth is, in truth is, it's not only a debate, but it's a philosophical thing. How do we look at everything in Torah? In every mitzvah in the Torah, we can, we can take this, this concept and we understand it, the Gavra and the Chefza. What is the obligation? Is the obligation on the person or on the object? Jews. Yeah, but it's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to a table or a piece of land. The land is prohibited. The land is prohibited. It's not that uh, you'll soon see another difference. Because in essence, can I violate the law? Is it possible that if it's up to me, it's the gavra, then it's up to me to violate the law? But if the land doesn't belong to me, so I cannot, in essence, do anything to the land because it doesn't belong to me. Yeah. So the question is, that's the question. When the Torah says you shall not work the land, that means that you, do you, do you, have, to, do you have to intentionally not to work the land? What happens if I Is it mine? What happens if I do work the land? I did the sin. I broke the, 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 the negative command, and I did work the land. What happens? Is that, does that, is that land mine? I'm just violating the law. If it's up to me, then the land is mine. I broke the law. But if it's not mine, so that the land's not mine to begin with, and I broke the law, and the land is still not mine, because it's a negative on the land. So it's, it's, it, 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 it goes deeper, in essence, this concept of how you look at something. On the Gavra or the Hefta. When something is prohibited, it can become mine even though it's prohibited. It's prohibited on me, so how does it become mine? Oh, or it's prohibited on me because I, I prohibited on me, so I have to take it upon myself, this prohibition. If I don't take it upon myself, then it becomes mine. It still, it still becomes mine. We'll, we'll soon see another. We'll soon see another example. We'll soon see another example. We'll take a look at. Let's look at another mitzvah of shmita in text number five a. That's why it's so important to have this book because it's hard. To, it's this hard. This class will be a little technical. You need the. You need the. You need the. Uh, you need the text. We need to look in the verse text number five a, on page sixty one of your book. The verse says. But in the seventh year, you shall release it. This is a very interesting expression. It says that you need to release it. The land's released. No, the Torah says you need to release it. The land is released on its own, so you don't really do anything. The seventh year, the seventh year, the land is released. No, the Torah says. Vashviyas tishmitena, you, on the seventh year, you shall release it and abandon it. The poor of your people shall eat it. And what you leave over, the beast of the field shall eat. So shall you do to your vineyard and your altar. It's, your, it's an obligation on, on the person. That is the meaning. Maimonides says, it's a positive commandment to divest oneself from everything that the land produces in the sabbatical year. Anyone who locks his vineyard or fences off his field in the sabbatical year has nullified a positive commandment. It's also true if he gathers all his produce into his home. Instead, he should leave everything ownerless. Thus, everyone has equal rights in every place, as the verse states, and the poor of your land shall eat it. So here we see, in essence, we see that the Gavra, the, he has to, one who has to release it. He's got to make the thing ownerless. It's his obligation to make the thing ownerless. 
If he doesn't do that, in essence, and he, according to this, if he doesn't do that, even though he's doing a negative commandment, if a poor man comes and takes the food, he's a ganav. Because the person did not make it onerless. He's supposed, you're right, he's doing a sin. But ultimately, he didn't make it onerless. And since he didn't make it onerless, then he's doing a sin, but you're doing a sin too, because you're stealing. It's Shmita, but he has to make it onerless. If it was on the chefs on the land, so you, I can lock up my, 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 my fence. I can lock up my field. Another guy can come and jump in because it's all of this. Can you take it and put it in a silo so no one can come? As long as there's food in the field. The second is no food in the field, then I have to empty my silos. Here, seemingly, the, the Rambam writes, that's an obligation on the person. It's an obligation of persons, even though the thing, the Torah says, I want your field to be ownerless, but the person needs to make it ownerless. If he doesn't make it ownerless, he didn't have Vera, but the person who took the food, he's also liable to also, because he's a Ghanif. Stole my food. He stole my food that I needed to make ownerless. This is a diff. So this is a whole, or it could be both. It could be both. It's a concept that he has to make it ownerless, but also it's ownerless on its own. The chafza becomes ownerless. Number six. Yosef ba bad. Eighteen hundreds. Writes on this mishnah on this mitzvah. One may understand this mitzvah is that it addresses to the person, namely the Torah commands the landowner to declare his produce ownerless in the seventh year. Thus, if he declares it ownerless, it indeed is. But if he doesn't, he decides, I don't want to declare my, 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 my field ownerless. I know the laws of Shemitah. I don't want to keep the Shemitah. My land. I decide I don't want to keep the shmita. While he's still considered to be violating mitzvah, he's doing an aveda, the produce nevertheless belongs to him. And it's not up for grabs. Such anyone who helps himself to the goods is stealing because the owner did not make a loan. Or perhaps this rule of owner's produce doesn't imply that the owner has to do anything to make it owners, but rather everything becomes owners automatically by divine creed. The only way to the owner can violate this is if he actively locks the gate and the field of that, well, now when he locks the gate, you're breaking into somebody's house. Of course, against the will of the owner, it would certainly belong to him as it is ownerless, as it is ownerless. This, so in essence, if a guy, the question is, when you say, when the Torah says you have to make it ownerless, does it mean it has to make a declaration of ownerless? He has to say, I have now made all this thing ownerless. Or he has to, to negate this mitzvah. He has to put the, he has to put dogs. He has to put a fence around his field, lock the fence, put the German shepherds there. And now I show you that I'm not going to make this ownerless. Oh, but you're going against the Torah. Very good. I'll go get started. I'll deal that with God. But uh, I don't want to make this produce ownerless. I want to keep this produce. What is it? What are we trying to show you? Details are important to the mitzvah. <laughs> that's how you see. That's how you see in halacha how details. How? So the truth is, if you wouldn't know all these details about this whole concept in Gemara, Gavra Chetzer, you really wouldn't know really the mitzvah. You really wouldn't comprehend how you attack and do this mitzvah. How do we attack and do this mitzvah shemitah? Let's say you didn't, you didn't make it onerless. Did you really do the mitzvah? Maybe not. Maybe yes. 
So the details actually is going to change the whole mitzvah. of this is self so I'm just showing you one concept which, which the truth is the God and the Chetzer, if you want to look at it you can go through every mitzvah and the Torah and you can, you can analyze every mitzvah and the Torah on this analytical way of thinking. It's a Gemara thing if you want to become a Gemara cup as they would call it, a Talmudic head and have an analytical head where you analyze everything in the Torah and you can analyze it in, in, in many forms. But here I give you an, a, a form and a way to analyze the Torah, what the Gemara does. You can do this and we can go in every detail. The Torah, how, did this ex, how is this expressed? And what is the obligation? I gave you the example of mezuzah, et cetera. So we can go, so we're going into the detail. Isn't that, so, so we see that, the, that we need to go into the detail because the truth is without the detail, uh, without the detail of Shemitah, you are really to do the Shemitah. What is the meaning of Shemitah? Does the, the, does, the, does the farmer have to just walk away from his land? Does the farmer have to declare it ownerless? And by not declaring it ownerless, did he accomplish the mitzvah? There's a question. And according to some, he, even though the field becomes ownerless, the, ga, the chafza would become ownerless, the field would become ownerless. But since the gavra, the person did not announce it as ownerless, maybe it didn't become ownerless. Maybe it's still his. Does the guy have to put a fence around it to make it not his? So this is, I'm just gonna, this, and that's the beauty of this mitzvah. That's the beauty of this mitzvah. Is still <coughs> why do we need such details? Why do we need to become so analytical? You know, becoming so analytical and becoming Gemara heads is sometimes you forget the arguments, sometimes all the arguments and the details and the argument back and forth. You forget the mitzvah, forget how important the mitzvah is itself. Mitzvah Tefillin, we all put on Tefillin, hopefully. If you go learn the halachas of Tefillin, the laws of Tefillin, detail, and how you put on Tefillin, when you put on Tefillin, which way you put on Tefillin, how do you accomplish this mitzvah? It goes into extreme detail, but people don't realize how everything is so detailed. And every detail ultimately is on the way that you're ultimately going to accomplish this mitzvah. The way you're going to ultimately do kilchosa. Yes, you have a question? Yes. So this mitzvah is not like with Shabbos. This has more detail than Shabbos where... There's no, a... Shabbos is also very detailed. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> we'll, get to, we'll, get, we'll get to what's so special about this mitzvah out of all other mitzvahs. Why did it... You're right, every mitzvah has details. The question is, why does Shmita mention? No, we'll get to that in a minute. There's no loophole in this mitzvah, like you can't sell the land to a guy. And that's the loophole that they came up with now, that they <laughs> sell the land. Some people hold, hold by that loophole. The, the, the whole argument in Israel right. today, that the, 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 the Rabbanut sell, does that loophole. Uh -huh. They sell the land, but a lot, of, a lot of Jews in Israel don't agree with it. And they won't eat from that. From that, that's why you, you have to be very careful. You go to Israel today in this year to make sure what what do you what is what what kind of stringency you want in, in the way you go out and eat food in Israel today to make sure make sure that they follow what you what you accept or don't. So if you follow the example about Nut, it's easier. If you follow the Eid Achredis, it they're much more stricter in that. So all their produce in the land of Israel is comes from Arab lands, from lands that are owned by, by Arabs, by Goyim, or shipped in from out of, out of, out of Israel. So it's a difficult year in, in Israel. It's a, it's a difficult year. I mean, it's not a difficult year, Baruch Hashem. There's, there's, there's enough food there. I don't think there's a, that's a bother. They have a problem. But 
If you go to Israel, you have to be careful to this year. And actually, not only this year, but going into next year too, because it takes time for to make sure that the produce that you eat next year is not from the pro, produce of the previous year. It's it's the it's yeah. produce of the new year. So it's it's a difficult, it's a difficult journey. I was once Shemitah in Israel, and you have to be careful. You have to be careful. You just can't go to any grocery store to take a fruit. You have to make sure that they're following the laws of Shemitah. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand this. If God intended for the land to rest because he determined that it was good for the land, then any hanky-panky, any selling it to someone or giving it away, that you're not allowing that mitzvah to be performed by the land. The land is no, if it's, no, you see, But if you look at the, at the mitzvahs and the gavra, then God wanted you to rest. You're resting. You're resting. God wanted you to rest. You are resting. God didn't want the land. God wanted that you should rest from the land. Not that the land should rest per se. You should rest. I think he wanted both. I don't know. I'm just telling you. You, you maybe you want both. It is, it is not so simple. You can you you find both concepts. You find it's both good ways. for the land, the nutrients replenish. The trader does not say that. That's your interpretation. The nutrients. Just the trader does not say that. First of all. Any farm will tell you for the nutrients, no, it lowers. Field, you don't do all your fields in one year. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Okay. So for the nutrients of the land, you would do land, you would do separate, you would, you would you do rotate of the land. So, so it's not for the nutrients of the land because if it was the nutrients around, they would do it differently. It's the trader says, Shabbos Hashem. That's it. The land of Israel every seven years, whether nutrients, not nutrients, this is a miss from the trader. It's a, it's not only for the nutrients of the land. Yeah. So, Rabbi, uh, now if you're, if we're in Israel, which we're going in a couple of weeks, and we're in Machne Yehuda looking at the fruits and vegetables, what you do we look for? There's a, there's a tudash. Of, of, there's a tudah. They have a special tudah. They need a special tudah. Uh, they need a special certificate. Like it is a certificate of kosher, there's a certificate that they're following the laws of Shemitah. You Same thing with a restaurant. If we go to a restaurant, yeah, yeah, okay, they would have a certificate yeah, also. Yes, you want to go to the door? I need to. <laughs> okay, so everything, just everything. Shmita is not the Truma Meisters. Shmita is everything that grows in Israel. You need to make sure that everything you're going to eat there, it comes from either other places. Or it's done through the Rabbanut, where they sold the land, or whatever. It's it, you have to make sure, you have to be careful. Don't need to be strong. Going back to Elliot, you don't have to, the, the Gemara statement. You don't need to be need more stringent than God is stringent on you. Don't be more stringent than God. If God said you shouldn't work the land, don't say okay. The God means the land should do no. If God said you shouldn't wait the land, means you shouldn't wait the land. But if somebody else is working land, it's not a problem. Don't become more more chumra. Don't become more chumra than God Himself. Add stringency upon yourself that you don't need to add. But this is important. That's why the rabbanut holds that if they sell the land, not even that you, you, if you sell like if you sell your land to a uh, to a non-Jew for the year. You're allowed to eat the land. So you might say, oh, that's not right. No, it's not. It's not a loophole. It's not considered a loophole. It's considered that that's not the, the, that's not the law. Don't make the law more than the law. We are to look at the detail. That's the problem. You see, the, the problem is once we start rationalizing or, or going too much into detail, we miss the mitzvah. We really lose the mitzvah. In many ways, because we have to understand what the mitzvah is. If you look in the details, why the Ramam says that the details are important? Text number seven on page sixty-three. I will now I will now tell you, with an intellectual, what an intellectual person ought to believe in this respect, namely that each commandment has a, a, a necessarily a cause. 
far as its general character is concerned and serves a certain object, objection. But I regard to its detail, we hold that it has no ulterior ob object, object. When Maimonides, for example, says, for example, the law of Shechita, he gives the example, we'll see the, the law of Shechita. There's indeed a reason for this mitzvah. But the nitty-gritty the, the nitty details of the mitzvah, it has nothing per se to do with the mitzvah. Where to shecht, and then they the tied to shecht, and which place to shecht, and how to... That's a detail. The detail, <laughs> there's a reason why the mitzvah is, the, 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 the clawless of the mitzvah. And then there's a detail. Not per se, per, not per se that Adam said that the two things go together. The, the, the general has a reason, the Abishta's reason why he wants you to shecht an animal. The nitty gritty of, the, and that's why the Torah says you shecht an animal, finish. Now, you know how many lachas there in shechita? You know how many laws there is in shechita? There's hundreds of laws in shechita. There's not only hundreds of laws in shechita, there's hundreds of customs in shechita. And therefore you have many, like today you have many different shechitas. There's five shitas, Ashkenazi shitas, Chassidic shitas. There's so many shitas. Why? Because everybody, there's so many laws and details in shitas. But there are right. Don't get, don't, don't get lost in the details. Right, the details are important, but it has a separate issue to the law. It is the general law. What the Torah wanted with shitas. Why an animal is shechted? The mitzvah trillin. The Torah says a Jew should put on tefillin. Now you have five, five different ways how to put on tefillin. Ashkenazim, in Ashkenazim, there's different ways of putting on tefillin. In Tzvaidik, there's different ways of putting on tefillin. But we all put on tefillin. So the mitzvah klal is, is, is to put on tefillin. How are you going to put the tefillin on? You're going to go this way, you're going to go that way, you're going to put this way, you're going to put seven, you're going to put five, you're going to put three, you're going to put three over here, I don't know. You're going to... Details. Everybody should follow their, their custom in their detail. But the detail per se does not connect to the general. That's why the Ramam looks at it. This looks at it different. Chassidut looks at it different. Chassidus looks at it different. And the way Chassidus looks at it is in text number eight. Chassidus explains what's the difference between a mitzvah and Torah. What's the difference? Torah is the wisdom of God. And a mitzvah is the will of God. If you characterize a mitzvah as the will of God, then every detail is in it. If I, ask, if I have a will, then you, to fulfill my will, every detail is in it. Because until that detail is fulfilled, then my will is not fulfilled. When I have a certain will, a ratzain, and everything that is in this will is every detail. It's not just a general principle. Ratzain is to the essence of everything. So if I have a, a will to something, it's to the detail. In my will has every detail. He says, God desired that we fulfill a mitzvah at a deep, absolute level. The Hebrews do it. That's why we could characterize that what is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is the will of the Hebrews. And if it's the will of the Hebrews, it encompasses everything. In other words, God is entirely invested, so to speak, in his desire for us to fulfill the mitzvah. That's why we call a mitzvah the will of God. Because the Abish is totally invested in this mitzvah. He has his whole desire and will is in this mitzvah. It exists independently, entirely one-sided. When I have a will, and I'm asking you to fulfill my will, it's one-sided. It's my will. It's not your will. If I would ask you to fill your Fulfill my will through your... I don't want you to fill my will through your will. I have decided to, to accomplish one's will, then you have to know what my will is. 
to fulfill that will. And the truth is, that's why we struggle with, with relationships in general. Because it's hard really to, to fulfill each other's wills because most of the time we don't tell each other what our will is. We expect other people to know what the will, what's my will. If we were honest and we told each other our, our true will, then why would another person not want to fulfill that will if they want to have a relationship with us? We don't tell each other and then we get frustrated. Oh, you're not fulfilling my will. You don't read my mind. You're not reading my mind. Correct. <laughs> you talk and you don't, you're not reading my mind. We've been married for 50 years and you're still not reading my mind. You're, I'm expected to read you. you, know, you ex we expect another person to read our minds. And we don't want to say our will. Maybe we're uncomfortable saying our will. Maybe for enemies, right? Whatever. But ultimately, how do you expect for another person to fulfill the desires of your life if you're not going to tell them what your true will is? Then why did Therefore, God did the gift. That's why the, that's why the Torah says God did get details. That's why the Torah, everything was given on Mount Sinai. That's why the Ashi says everything. Don't that God's general sent on Mount Sinai. And his details, so to say, were not, you know, not so important to the general, like the Rambam says, no. Apixid is the detail and the, the general all set up outside because God, because the deep, because the mitzvah is God's will. And if it's God's will, then God needed to say the detail. But there's 18 gates of repentance. How do you know? That's something else. That's something else. That's a, not, that, that is something else. That has nothing to do with the mitzvah. Every mitzvah, I'm talking about simple mitzvah. You don't go go tshuva. Every simple mitzvah, because first of all, you bring it up. I mean, this, every mitzvah you do, you can make it a different level. Because that's up to you, what, what your level of understanding is. But everybody knows what the will of tshuva is, what the will of the mitzvah to turn to God. That's, the, that's his will. You go to fill that, those details in that, in, in, in that, in that will. But there's interpretation. There's no interpretation to tshuva. There's no interpretation to a mitzvah. Everybody knows what tefillin is. There's no interpretation to any mitzvah in the Torah. Yeah, but you just said that something. There's customs. Like yeah, but that's but that's not the that's not the the, the the no interpretation to the actual mitzvah of putting on tefillin. Then you have the details. You're right. Then you have the details. Which, if I'm a, I'm a chabadik, then I fulfill the, my my mitzvah of tefillin through these details. And I feel that's the will of the Abish that I fulfill it through these details. It's not that the details are extra. You fulfill your, your mitzvahs to, to, through the way you were brought up, and I fulfill the mitzvahs the way I brought up. And both are the will of God. They have only a Chabad will. He has an Ashkenazic will. He has a Svidic will. He has a lit, lit will. He has everybody. He can, he, can handle a, he can handle the will of everybody. He can handle... The the, 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 the the way a person does it in any kind of a facet, any kind of a way. Because ultimately, we're there to fulfill God's will. Detail is important. So let's look at the words over here. Fulfillment. This will exists independently, entirely on one side. As such, this will is not subject to change or expiration. Rather, it's absolute and eternal because it's part of the mitzvah. What then did the sage mean? They stated, what does God care where precisely the location of the slaughter takes place? But God cares you slaughter it. If the will invest in the midst of deep his desire, of, of course he cares. The answer is our state, sage's statement is only on an external, ulterior level. Right? It's like the Rambam says. The Rambam is talking more externally, intellectually, intelligent person. The once uh, 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 deep, absolute, on a one side level, so to speak, God's most certainly does care. After all, a mitzvah is the manifestation of God's deepest one side desire. And in that state, God wishes that the mitzvah be performed in a specific way, regardless of anything or anyone else, period. Such only when performed with precision does it reflect God's true will. What does that mean? What is the message? 
The Rebbe explained, the Rebbe, the Rebbe in text of AB says, what is the, so what is the, the Rebbe? What does the Rebbe Rashab want to say? He says, in other words, even the tiniest detail of a mitzvah are part of this one-sided absolute desire reflected in God's true absolute nature. That is the Abish's will. Every like, detail. So even though there are there are in the title color the same, the general, and this prata same, the, the way they come into particular, and this the, the came, the way they're very extremely precise, they're all one concept. They're all one concept, the will of Akadish Baruch. Hu. There's no difference. A Jew should not look up Chsidis. A Jew should not look at any difference between the particular and the general. So the truth is, that is all mitzvahs. We still have the question. So why does it say at Shemitah? You could have said this thing by Tefillin. You could have said this by Shechita. You could have said this thing by Shabbos. You could have said this concept by every mitzvah. Because every mitzvah is God's will. The Rebbe answers in text number 9a in, the, in the rotation in our trade portion is that it general rules and finer details are set at Sinai, even the details and minute associate only with how to carry out the mitzvah, they too are a part of the real mitzvah. Namely, the deep one sided godly, thus there are two state at Sinai, one sided overture. Oh, what is the message? Let's, we're, we're almost at the end. Let's see, let's see how the Rebbe answers. Because still, have, Let's see. One, text number 9b. One may, I can argue and say that at Sinai, the details and the nuances were stated only those mitzvahs that were immediately re relevant. This is the title and essence. Think about it. Take the law of Shemitah. Were told at Mount Sinai according to this law of Shemitah. It's the law of Shemitah in a desert. Shemitah in a desert, they don't they have no land. Any of these laws in the desert. They were 40 years in the desert. Then they had to conquer the land. Seven years to conquer land. Then they had to divide the land. Another seven, 14 years. This Shemitah didn't start until after 14 years. We were talking about 54 years later. Why would it be important to tell the Jews a mitzvah that they wouldn't do for 54 years? Right? So why tell them a mitzvah? Why? You could say that. Surely, why tell them the particulars? Tell them, okay, you know what? When we go, when we come to Eitzel, we're going to do this mitzvah. And I'll tell you about it. I'll actually tell you about it in 40 years from now, because it's not important right now, right? It's not important, actually not important. Like you said, the majority of Jews that they didn't even make it to Israel. So why tell them a mitzvah and tell them the, the, the and the, the, the bigger question is that even Moshe Rabbein doesn't even mention the mitzvah in, in, in Deuteronomy, right? You mentioned the beginning of class, the Moshe Rabbein doesn't even mention this mitzvah in Deuteronomy. And they're the holding to go into it so. So the to 40 years ago, a mitzvah that they didn't do 40 years, they were not going to do it for another 14 years. Why would it be important to tell them the particular, the mitzvah, the general mitzvah of Shemitah, and not only the, not only the general, but all its details? And all its minute details, and the Gavin, the Chepzen, how are you going to do this, the, 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 the person, and the, or the object? Why would he do that for? The answer is, because it's the Ratzon of the Abishta. We don't do a mitzvah. <laughs> because even today, you have a lot of mitzvahs you can't do. Still the Ratzon of the Abishta. Still the Ratzon of God. We went through with us now, we're going through Leviticus, which is all the mitzvahs of, of Karbanis, 
Anybody have anybody lately done a carbon? Anybody brought a carbon chatas? Anybody brought a carbon shlomen? Anybody brought a, all these carbonas? None of us have done it. We haven't done it in the last 2,000 years. But it's still the notes of the Abish. It's not important. It's important to know the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's why you're learning. Amit Hashem. Mashiach, come today. You're able to accomplish that will. But it has nothing to do with if you're going to do it now or not. It has to do that you should know. Every one of us should know. The will of God. What does God want from us? And not only in general principles, we should know in particular. We should know the minute detail of every will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And God does not hide it. He told the, he told the general and he told the particular. And he told Moshe Rabbein to teach the Jewish people that they should know every corner, right, left, side, top, by they should know every aspect of the trade. Nothing should be hidden. From them, what my rotten is, what my, 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 my will is. And I want you to teach them, how, and what's the, what's the example? I want you to teach them Shemitah. They're not going to keep Shemitah for many years. And maybe some of them will never ever keep Shemitah, as we said. Most of them died in the desert. But I want you to teach them my rotten. I want you to teach them my will. What is my rotten? My rotten is that in Mitzvah Shem, you're going to keep Shemitah. That's my Ratzon. And know it now. So too, every mitzvah is the same thing. The mitzvah you could do, the mitzvah you can't do, the mitzvah you can accomplish today, the mitzvah you are waiting to accomplish. Everybody should know every mitzvah from its general principle to its particular principles. That's why the Rebbe, most interesting, the Rebbe asked people to learn the Rambam, that we should learn Maimonides every day. Maimonides, to, yesterday we finished the book of Maimonides, we, those who learn three chapters a day. So there's three ways you can learn this. And this is a beautiful thing. You should all do this. There's three ways to learn the Rambam. The Rambam, you can learn three chapters a day, and then you'll complete the whole Rambam in one year. You'll complete the whole Maimonides. You know what it means to complete the whole Maimonides? The Rambam went through every mitzvah. So by learning it, by learning the Rambam, three chapters a day, you, at the end of the year, you're going to have a, a broader understanding of every mitzvah. If you can't do that, learn one chapter a day. So you'll complete the whole Rambam in three years. If you can't do that, learn Sefer mitzvahs. The Rambam also wrote, called Sefer mitzvahs. he wrote... A, a, a explanation of every mitzvah. Separate thing, Sefer mitzvahs, and it's divided into the year. And you could every day learn whatever one or two mitzvahs, the 630 mitzvahs. And it's divided. You can get it, you can download it from the Chabad.org, you can go on Chabad.org, you can get either two chapters or one chapter or Sefer mitzvahs. You know, learn every, every day a mitzvah or two. And the Ramam explains it. And you can go even further and learn more into it. But imagine after a year, you have all the mitzvahs. You get a knowledge in the mitzvahs. What the Abishta wanted, what was his will? Again, it's unimportant. If a lot of these mitzvahs, you cannot do. A majority of mitzvahs that you cannot do because you don't have a base of Mikdash, which a majority of mitzvahs are connected to the temple. You don't have a king. You don't have all these mitzvahs. That's not important to me. I mean, sure, but that's what we pray for Mashiach, so that Mashiach should come and be able to do all these mitzvahs. But right now, what's important to me, whether I can do it or not, I want to know the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I want to know the will of God. And I don't want to know this. I want to know, when I want to know the will of God, I want to know to the essence. I want to try whatever my capability in my brain to be able to understand the mitzvah kill chasa. To mitzvah, to all its details. Because the Abish did it to his will, he didn't leave out a detail. Because you cannot leave out a detail when it comes to God's will. So that's the beauty. That's what the Rebbe says, this mitzvah was chosen. Because this mitzvah teaches us on all mitzvahs. 
with regard to other mitzvahs that were only to be carried out later date, can it argue that only the overall precept was stated at Sinai, where all the technical detail was saved for later, close to the time when they would be relevant. Shemitah is such a mitzvah, as it would take effect later after setting the land, which would be, as I said, Mount Sinai, to when they settled the land, was over 54 years later. And is a big idea contained in our parasha specifically. The parasha that speaks about Shemitah. When we say that the overall precepts and the details were set at Sinai. The message is that even the details are not relevant until much later. That would not be relevant much later. They too were said and are part of God, godly manifestation at Sinai. And so it is that every other mitzvah, even the minute details, that seem relevant only in so far as it contributes to our knowledge, how to carry out the mitzvah. You might say the whole, the whole detail is only there for knowledge. No, the details too is a part and parcel of God's true desire. So Chassidus goes more than the Rambam. The Rambam says the details is only how to do the mitzvah. Don't lose, don't get lost in the details because you might get, you might, you might, you, the importance is the mitzvah. Tells you the details is the mitzvah. The details is God's desire, as the mitzvah is God's desire. It's, it's two from Sinai. And that's the beautiful teaching of Siddhas that the Rebbe teaches us that we should look at every mitzvah. Siddhas, going to Chasidut, we should look at every mitzvah as the will of Akadish Baruch, Hu, the will of God, which is important to us, it should be important to us to know the will of HaKadosh Baruch to know the will of God, whether we're going to do it today or we're going to do it tomorrow or we're going to do it whenever Mashiach comes, we need to know the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What is God's will? Wish you all on this special day of Lag Barima, which is the uh, celebration of Shema Bayechai, which in, in truth brought out this whole teaching. This whole teaching is based on the teaching of Hashem Bechai, who brought out the Zaya, which is to bring out the will of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, not the technicalities, not only the technicalities and the uh, and the uh, in the mitzvahs of uh, the do's and the don'ts, but really to bring out that every do's and don'ts has within it true true God's will, true God's true God's essence, because the will is the that's like will is the essence of a person. The will of the Eibishter is his essence. And that's why it says, that when the Gemara says, when it says, Anoichi, Anoichi, I am God, your God, the first commandment, the Ten Commandments, the Gemara, the Talmud says, Anoichi, Aleph, Nun, Chaf, Yud, stands for the acronym of Ani, I, Nafshi, my soul, Ksavis, I have written, Yehovis, I have given to you. I have to look at the Torah and every mitzvah as if I'm touching God's essence. God's true will. And by that, by learning Chassidus, by learning Chassidut, by learning Kabbalah, that's the way we learn the beauty of this whole lesson. I wish you all a wonderful Lag Boma. I want to invite you all, invite people, tell people at 4.30, we're having a uh, Lag Boma celebration at the park, South County Park. The big park had to find the Sunshine Pavilion. We're going to have rides for the kids and a barbecue and music. And everybody's welcome, men, women, and children, come and celebrate today, like Baimer, the joy of Rabbi Shimon Baichai. Have a wonderful and beautiful day.